is risen. Our opening hymn, Jesus Christ is risen today. Risen and saving Jesus, Mary's mistaken gardener, call out our names in compassion that we might recognize you. O Jesus, be present in the midst of your disciples. Risen and saving Lord, appearing unknown to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, set our hearts on fire with your love for you. O Jesus, be present in the midst of your disciples. Risen and saving Lord, granting assurance of healing and forgiveness to distraught followers, bring us together in peace and harmony. O Jesus, be present in the midst of your disciples. Risen and saving Lord, caring for your disciples in a meal on the shore of the sea, Make yourself known to us in all acts of hospitality and sharing. O Jesus, be present in the midst of your disciples. Risen and saving Lord, lifting hands of blessing on all humankind, grant that our prayers and praise may be gathered into yours on behalf of the whole world. O Jesus, be present in the midst of your disciples as we pray the prayer 
first issuing from your lips. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Christ, according to St. John, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father, your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God bless to our understanding this, our reading from the Gospel of Christ. Amen. A crown of thorns placed on his head. He knew that he would soon be dead. He said, did you forget me, Father, did you? Thank you. 
had used his sword to pierce the body of our Lord, said truly this was Jesus Christ our Savior. He looked with fear upon his sword, then turned to face his Christ and Lord, fell to his knees, Took from his head the thorny crown And wrapped him in a linen gown Then laid him down to rest inside the tomb The holes in his hands, his feet inside Now in our hearts we know he died Three days went by, again they came To move the stone, to bless the slain With oil and spice anointing, hallelujah But as they went to move the stone They saw that they were not alone For Jesus Christ has risen I've entitled my message for today, Should We Do Less? Can We Be Called Christian? Should We Do Less? Can We Be Called Christian? But before considering it, though, join me in prayer, won't you? Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts resonate with your truth, O God. For in what is spoken and heard comes with it a desire to know you better, to know ourselves better, and from that intersection to always and everywhere keep Christ on our mind, Christ on our lips, and Christ in our heart. Amen. As I've suggested elsewhere and at other times, one of the most powerful tools or in some instances, the better descriptor is powerful weapons, that any one of us possesses is the words we use to describe people, places, or events. Few know this better than news reporters. Regardless of whether their recounting is done in print, online, or via the television, for with a well-chosen word, or even a careless one for that matter, Attitudes are influenced and impressions are made that may or may not be accurate as to facts. Indeed, within the last couple of weeks, an account from a local media outlet implied the involvement of Bridge Street Church in an incident when, in actuality, we never were. As an intentional interim ministry practitioner, 
One of the signs that I look for in assessing the collective health of a congregation is how language is utilized in times of dispute or conflict. Particularly telling is the times when folks default to stereotyping or labeling people with summary judgments. And by that I mean language like, we all know he's an angry man, or everybody feels that she needs to, you fill in the blank. If ever there was an example of judgmental language being used absent any check as to its accuracy or appropriateness, surely we encounter it in the events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion and in particular the labeling of those two men who were put to death, one on either side of him. Thinking of them for a moment, let me ask you a question. Do you remember how they were identified? That is to say, what moniker was given to them? Now, if my hunch is right, a great many, if not all of us, were quick to identify the two as being thieves. That's right, thieves. This acknowledged, what else do we know about them? The answer, nothing or precious little. Alas, their names are not part of the story. Neither is their citizenship, excepting to say that they couldn't be Roman because Romans were never executed by hanging. The law specifically forbade it. Further still, we remain in the dark as to what they did to warrant the designation and then its punishment. Did they steal a sack of shekels or a few fish? Did they pilfer for profit not needed or... Did they lift a loaf of bread to fill a child's empty belly? We just don't know, but what we do know, even if we don't want to admit it, is that for time in memorial, these two fellows have been denied even a shred of dignity or thoughtful regard. Shamefully, they've been cast off as expendable and subjected to the plight that so many others have endured throughout history. They remain nameless. The only record that they even existed comes from someone or some system who defined them by a single act. They had run amok of the law. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I've not been, nor will I likely be, subjected to that same kind of heartless, come-again, ruthless judgment. For if I had been, or if I would be, it could be said of me that I was slash am a cheater, a liar, a thief, and a tattletale. And you know what? It would all be true. For at some point or another in my life, I've fudged my score when as a teenager I learned to play poker. I've fibbed about how pretty my date's dress was, even though I thought it was horrid. I've pilfered a candy back in the day when they were five for a penny. And I've called the police when I suspected someone was driving while being impaired by drugs or alcohol. To those who might be inclined to say, well, those events really don't count in assessing your character, you were too young, too foolish, too rumbunctious, my reply, I guess it comes down to how lucky I was and what strata of society my family and I live in. For believe you me, while the idea may be that we all come into this world with similar opportunity and that we can all have a comparable measure of success in how we live life, that is not what I've observed during my 31 years in Christian ministry. Regrettably, I've known directly and through the work of others that there are many individuals who, through no fault of their own, have drawn the short stick or been dealt a hand in the game of life that will see them, never see them, realize even a modicum of what we in the middle class assume is usual and, dare I say, our due. 
it is for those folks and because of those folks that I believe that we, who understand ourselves to be a resurrection people, those called and claimed by the risen Christ, must do everything possible to humanize the lumped together and nameless ones, those assigned pejorative titles like lazy, druggy, ne'er-do-well. And we need to do that by two things. One, conveying Jesus' message of hope. Hope for different, hope for better, hope for more. And the second thing we need to do right alongside that first is to, in obvious ways, demonstrate love in action. The very love that Jesus first shared during his earthbound efforts and subsequently entrusted to us to do likewise with. Being mindful of this gospel mandated imperative to be in solidarity with the marginalized. I am so delighted, so very delighted to share with you the news that Bridge Street Church, the John Howard Society, Hastings and Prince Edward Public Health, and Grace Inn have been recognized by Hastings County as having the facility and capacity that is space and personnel to cooperatively operate a daytime drop-in center appealing to those who would otherwise be subjected to hours upon hours of aimless wandering and unsheltered living seven days a week, 52 long weeks a year. Trust me when I say that it gives me tremendous joy to affirm that by this initiative, Bridge Street Church is demonstrating in a concrete way its stated mission, stated vision, and stated values. By utilizing our gymnasium as the drop-in center initially for one year only, I believe that soon and very soon an obvious spirit of encouragement and energy will enliven the church permitting you and I an unparalleled opportunity to be more aware of, more involved with, and pray God perhaps even more inclined to befriend those who are our downtown neighbors. For further details of this remarkably exciting and, to us, cost-less opportunity, Please read the pastoral letter I released by email just a few days ago, or if need be, do reach out to Carol in our church office, and one will be provided you. I hope that you see, as I see, this drop-in center, a step along the journey towards Bridge Street Church's long continuing work and witness. As the risen Christ calls us to follow him in serving those who are too often forgotten about, left nameless and unappreciated, may his commandment be never far from our minds, our lips, our hearts, our hands. For was it not Jesus who said, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Should we do less? Can we be called Christian? I wonder. Thanks be to God for these words and the wisdom to proclaim them. Amen. The thirsty deer longs for the streams My thirsty soul longs I long for the face of
Chapter 16, the shorter ending to this gospel. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the witness of our ancestors in faith. May God's word speak to us in these words. Come on, Peter. Come on. Where are you? Hey, Mary. You wanted to talk? Yeah, there's something I wanted to tell you. Oh, maybe I should call back later. Peter? Yeah, Mary? Never mind. Maybe it's nothing. What, well, Mary? Like, what, what is so important that you don't want to talk about it? Like, what is it that you don't need to tell me that you just called me about? And... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just that I miss him. Yeah, Peter, I know. All of us are missing him. Yeah. I know, I know. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Not two days ago, our love was sitting over there laughing at one of Philip's stupid, stupid jokes. How many Roman centurions does it take to light a lamp? <laughs> His favorite, where he was curled up with the children all around him, telling stories of the journey through the desert. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then trying to beat me at arm wrestling. <laughs> the great carpenter versus the net holler debate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I miss, miss him. him. Yeah. 
I can't believe it's over. Peter. Didn't we start here? Okay, let, let me try again. Yes, Mary. Is there something on your mind? Peter, what if? What if? Mom, Mary, what are you trying to say? Well, Peter, what if it isn't over? He's dead, Mary. Jesus is dead. <laughs> of course it's over. I mean, do, do you think he's going to pull a Lazarus on us? Tap on the seal stone and hop out and have all his wrappings drop away and dance around? You went to the tomb. You saw his body. You were there. He's dead. He's dead. And I didn't do anything about it. I mean, if I had stood by him in the garden, we might have gotten away. Peter. By the holy name. If I hadn't denied him, at least I wouldn't be standing here talking with you. I wouldn't be staring at the wall knowing that I'm a coward. Knowing that I left him to die. Pete. I've been with him from the beginning, Mary. We talked and we argued and we stood in the face of the authorities. I should have died beside him. I should be dead. He, he, thought, he thought he was relying on his rock. All he had was a pile of rubble. Peter, stop. What? Peter, Peter, you were his rock then. You are his rock now. Peter, you are our rock. We need you. Grieve, get angry, be sad, be afraid, feel all the feelings, Peter. But you got to know that we will not let you go. We need you, Peter. Look at me. I'm asking you again, what if it isn't over? I don't understand, Mary. I mean, if Jesus were here with us, well, we'd be doing the same thing we were always doing, you know, walking with him and learning from him and teaching and helping people to understand that the Holy One is here and now, that we're part of, of the divine household. Yes, we're part of that divine household with the responsibility of loving God with all that we are and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Yeah. I know. If it weren't over, we'd been doing what we've done right from the beginning since he showed up in our lives. Peter, what did Jesus tell us to do if we got separated or if the authorities took him away? Well, he didn't really give us any orders well, except to love one another. But I, I guess he hoped that we would keep sharing God's love, the, the, the love that God had given him. Didn't he ask us to meet him? <laughs> he, he did say that if we ever got separated, that we should go to Galilee because he would always meet us there. Exactly. He said he would always meet us there. Mary, I know it's hard to believe. I know it's a shock, but he's dead. Y you saw him uh, take his last breath. You saw them take his body down and, and, and take it to the tomb. I mean, you were there this morning. You saw his body. I saw nothing. Well, then why imagine anything different? Because, Peter, I saw nothing. All right. My brother, 
I'm going to Galilee. I'm going where he said he would meet us. I'm going back to the beginning to see if I can find him there. I'm afraid what will happen when you don't find him there, sister? If I don't find him there, somehow, some way, life will go on. But Peter, I'm more afraid of what will happen when I do find him there. Brother, I'm going to Galilee. Are you coming? Are you coming? Are you coming? with mine and sing aloud this perennial favorite I danced in the morning
has begun, and I danced in the moon, and the stars and the sun, and I came down the and I danced on the earth, and I danced the choosing to spend part of this day with us, I do so hope it was a blessing to your soul. Until our paths cross again, may grace and peace abound in your life. Amen.
touch our hearts that we may know compassion from failing embers build a blazing fire love strong enough to overturn injustice to seek our world more gracious Come touch and bless our hearts Come touch our souls That we may know and love you Your quiet presence All our fears dispel Create a space For spirit to grow in us let life and beauty fill us Come touch and bless our souls Come touch our minds And teach them how to reason Set free our thoughts To wonder and to dream Help us to We are fragile And in our weakness Your great strength reveal That we may rise To follow and to serve Steady now on earth Come touch and bless our will